Hello, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, concurrent block session. This session today is useful climate action hubs to advance climate justice, equity, and health. I'm Dr. Jacoby Wilson. I'll be the moderator for this session. For this session today, we have uh, four speakers who have received funding uh, from the Waverly Street Foundation to establish climate action hubs, and they'll give a presentation of what they're doing. So we have Rodna Tripathi, Kwasi Dinsu. We also have uh, Cicely Garrett, Sarah Masila. I mean, I mispronounced this. I know you said it like three times, man. Uh, but you can, uh, happy to have y'all here today to be a part of this great session. And I'm also uh, a grantee of the Waverly Street Foundation. So I'm really excited to be able to moderate uh, this session with everybody. So let's get started. I want to go to Cicely first. Can you give a little bit of bio back on yourself um, as you begin your presentation? Yeah. Um, so my name is Cicely Garrett. I am joining you from Atlanta. I am the co-executive director of the National Black Food and Justice Alliance. Um, you can find out more about us at blackfoodjustice.org. Um, I've been the co-executive director along with Dr. Bass since January of 2022. Um, prior to that, I was the Deputy Chief Resilience Officer for the City of Atlanta, the 100 Resilient Cities Program, um, as well as done a lot of consulting um, with Black food sovereignty, small Black businesses, and just environmental justice. Um, I don't know. Do you guys hear the background noise? Is that me? Okay, sorry, I, I kept hearing it. Make sure you can hear me. Um, so, um, since joining, I don't know what that is. Do, do other people hear it too, or is it just me? Yes, uh, team on the IT team, can y'all mute on your side? And, and also, uh, as speakers, if you're not speaking, please mute on your side too. Panelists, okay. thank you. Thank you. Um, so, I am here with Dr. Densu. Um, and so the Alliance uh, was formed in 2013, um, and we were a membership organization of other member organizations um, from across uh, the U.S. Um, that were working toward um, Black food sovereignty, um, liberation, and self-determining food economies. Um, and so we have about 60, close to 60 members. Um, a few years ago, um, a group of academics came to us. Um, who do a lot of um, research um, and write books and other things that have to do with um, food, Black food um, and land sovereignty um, and felt like they wanted to support our work in a more focused way. Um, so Dr. Monica White um, and Dr. Shanti Reese um, collaborated with us um, and they formed a new group of membership that we had called the Black Academics. Um, and so these are Black academics at uh, academic institutions across the country. Some are at HBCU, some not. Um, and so as a part of that, they came up with different goals about how the Black academics would specifically support us. Um, and one of the things that came out of that, in addition to a journal that we'll be releasing next year um, and some specific research goals, um, was how do we preserve um, as well as amplify um, some of the really great work that's being done with regenerative ag um, and how it is an anchor to many of the things that we want to see happen um, just with climate change and community overall. And so they developed the concept um, that became known as the Agroecology Center. Um, so Dr. Um, will speak more specifically like today um, as it is, our first center is located at FAMU, Florida A&M University um, in Tallahassee, Florida. Um, but with the idea around the Agroecology Center, um, housed under the, under the National Black Food and Justice Alliance, um, we began to flesh out the concept even more. And so I won't say that the idea was unique per se, because um, as we approached Dr. Densu and Dr. Jennifer at FAMU to be our flagship, Agroecology Center, they too had had um, an idea quite similar and wanted to start something many years ago. So it was a really great match. Um, but traditionally, agriculture research um, and extension development had always focused on providing education, training, and technical assistance um, to medium or large scale farms. And so, you know, those sort of provided streamlined messages, technology, practices, and things. 
Um, but currently there are a large number of um, farmers um, that we would call small or family owned farms. Um, so less than 100 acres. Um, and they had not been a primary focus of what a holistic, participatory, sustainable development strategies and approaches look like. Um, but many of these locally, nationally, internationally are the lifeblood of many communities um, and also house some really great wealth of knowledge and practices um, for a group of people who are often aging out. And then you have a gap of younger people coming in and then how do you bridge these? Um, and come from a place that is very human centered instead of studying people, how do we preserve and amplify the rich knowledge that is there that extends well beyond the campus boundaries? Um, and how do you have a community led uh, learning environment um, that not only uh, preserves um, regenerative ag, but also uh, adds in the innovation about what it's gonna look like in the future. Um, and so we wanted to have a place for this. And we felt like it was critical to our work. Um, and how do we go beyond not only promoting farming as a viable profession, but all the other different avenues and professions and things that now come in and around agroecology and what that could look like. Um, and as there is a resurgence in regenerative ag, how do we also become a cultivation spot for what that looks like? And then even beyond that of being a hub in a community, from our perspective, we feel like land, um, food and land, but land especially, um, is sort of the foundation to where we would like to go and see things go move with um, regards to climate change mitigation. And so we feel like this model is, is critical to what we wanna see in the world, as well as, especially as um, environmental injustices, um, in, what do you call it? They, just, uh, they affect black communities and communities of people, the global majority and people of color. Um, it impacts us more severely. So it is even more important for us to be in this space um, and to ensure that we are providing not only an interdisciplinary space, um, but a think tank where black farmers and underserved farmer voices, needs, ideas, challenges, and strategies um, are discussed together with scholarship and research um, so that we can promote relevant changes and policy recommendations that are appropriate for our communities um, and solutions that are homegrown. And so with that um, came to be known as a concept that we embarked upon together called the Agroecology Center. The Agroecology Centers are meant to be a network of agroecology centers at historically black colleges and universities or HBCUs, um, because we feel like a lot of these universities, especially land grants, are where regenerative ag and agriculture started in training. And so that is the most appropriate place for them to be housed and archived. Um, Florida A&M is our first. Um, we will likely announce a second one this year and continue to grow until we have a collective of about eight to nine agroecology centers in our network. Um, and while they will all have a thread of a connection together under our umbrella, they will also be unique uh, in what they have to offer based on their geography and where they are within their communities of the U.S. Um, and so we are extremely excited to be on this journey um, and to have um, launched our first one last year with FAMU and to see them grow and flourish. Um, and I will turn it over to Dr. Dinsu, who will offer um, some more information about where the Agroecology Center is at FAMU currently um, and sort of their goals and what their thought process is. Um, but we feel like these are resilience hubs um, of most of the HBCUs across the country are central to, to their communities um, and a hub within that. And so why not also expand them as resilience hubs and places of learning and other stuff uh, to, to bring together the larger regional community around regenerative ag. Thank you, Dr. Densu. Can everybody see me? I'm, I'm trying to pull up the presentation. I, I have it uploaded into the system, but I'm not, there you go. Okay. So I'm gonna just build off of uh, what Cicely shared in many respects. Uh, we see the center as a space for self-determination and development of resilience. Um, and so the center itself is in Tallahassee, Florida, and we're very much trying to root us ourselves in the community which has been the case historically uh, in a way that the center 
contributes to a culture of resilience in a, a self-determined way. It's almost like our response to climate disruption and the negative impacts on, on people of African descent should be something that emanates from within the community, our response to it, our skill sets, our analysis of it, uh, the cultural realities of refashioning our relationship with the earth. Uh, it has to emerge from within that space. We take a bottom-up approach uh, to our development, very consistent with uh, an attempt to shift the way land-grant institutions have functioned historically. We can't talk about all land grants in the same way. So HBCUs, by virtue of their history, have a very unique relationship. We see ourselves in Tallahassee as an extension of the greater Caribbean. So our emphasis is not just on the US domestically, but the African diaspora in the international context. And as Cicely talked about, we're seeking to create institutions within the community uh, to foster intergenerational transmission of Black agroecological knowledge and praxis. Uh, and, and we see agroecology as, as a broad space uh, inclusive of uh, environmental justice. I don't know who's, am I moving the slides? Okay. So one of the emphasis we have uh, as the EJ movement has always made the argument is centering indigenous knowledge of, of, of black and other indigenous folk in the general sense and in developing knowledge production practices, dissemination strategies, capacity building and infrastructure develop that will advance this culture in the era of climate disruption. And we believe that's very important and rooted in that because transformations in the food system very much uh, we see as the progenitor of climate disruption. First in agriculture, then that evolved uh, to the modern industrial economy that we see now in its, its various components. So if we change the food system, if we reorientate ourselves to changing the food system, we begin to deal with climate disruption in a very fundamental way, but it, it extends beyond the food system. Uh, and as uh, Cicely talked about, uh, this is a pilot project. So we hope that it expands throughout the Southeast, in particular at other land grant institutions. Uh, and this is kind of a framework that we use to think about the interconnections. So FAMU has multiple institutions from an engineering school, an architecture school, the School of the Environment, School of Pharmacy and public health and allied sciences. So we see ourselves as an interdisciplinary space that creates opportunities for us to explore sustainability in a comprehensive uh, context, uh, centering climate justice and environmental justice. But you see things here like conservation ecology, bioremediation, coastal restoration, green energy, biomimicry, et cetera, sustainable green architecture, right? And sciences, political ecology, environmental history, uh, sustainability and public policy, indigenous knowledge. We are, we're attempting to bring all of these things together, uh, in particular in a organizational space we're calling land, the environment, and African diaspora. Uh, and and this, this work has both a, uh, community organizing component, a policy development component, as well as um, a research and education component. And then these are just some of uh, the core values of the center, uh, very consistent. And as Cicely said, this is a partnership between the National Black Food and Justice Alliance and FAMU within a broader context of an agroecology center uh, project. And that's real important because it's is rooted in community-based organizations. It's not just the university separate and independent from the communities in which we serve. And I'll end there. Can't hear you, Sakovic. 
I thought I unmuted. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Cicely uh, and Dr. Dinson for that uh, joint presentation. Uh, let's move to who's up next? Is it uh, Sierra or is it? Are you next, Sierra? I don't know, but I can go. <laughs> okay, go ahead, Sierra. Okay. Sorry, give me just one second. Okay, are you guys able to see this? Oh, yes. <laughs> Let me just stop this for a second. Sorry. Let me see the Okay, here we go. There we go. Are you guys seeing this? No? <laughs> oh, it's almost there. Okay. Is that the climate health awareness? Okay, yeah, we see it. Okay, so Chas Hot Sermus y las Lois Squest till some Yanaman Utis Gatlio. So I work at Saglash Kootenai College. My name is Sierra Masila. I am an enrolled tribal member of the Confederate Salish and Kootenai tribe uh, located on the Flathead Indian Reservation in Montana. And we're just going to jump right into this. So some facts about SKC, it was founded in 1977. Um, it's located in Pablo, Montana on the Flat Indian Reservation. It is one of seven tribal colleges in the state and it has the third largest graduation rate of all of the colleges and universities in Montana. So that's not just the tribal colleges. There are multiple degrees offered at Salish Kootenai College from workforce certificates to certifications of completion, associates, um, bachelor's degree, and a master's, two master's degrees that were just started a few years ago. Um, so this is just a little snippet from enrollment. So currently there are 621 students enrolled in St. Louis Community College. Um, of that, 59% are enrolled tribal members, 16% are descendants, um, and there are 75% full-time students, 25% of those are part-time. The breakdown for tribal affiliation is pretty unique. Um, CSKT, which is the tribe that is, is centered here, 27% um, of the students here are Salish Kootenai enrolled members, and 28% are other tribes throughout the United, or excuse me, throughout Montana, and 18% are tribes throughout the um, United States. Um, so this is a little interesting. So 267 students are um, enrolled in an associate's degree program 238 are enrolled in a bachelor's. There are currently three, it says, in a graduate degree, which I, I know is um, incorrect. There are more than that, but uh, 56 certifications of completion and um, 56 other. So that could be some program that SKC is just doing for maybe one or two quarters that hasn't really been identified. Um, since SKC was founded in 1977, there have been 4,453 students that have graduated either with a bachelor's or associates or certification of completion. Um, so the degree breakdown at SKC is pretty broad. So there's two master's degrees, eight bachelor degree programs, 22 associate degree programs. 11 certifications of completion and six workforce certifications. Okay, so to Waverly. Um, 
a lot of the things that we're doing are what the community needs, what's going to help the community and the students at SKC. And so the whole goal that we're using is what can we do to increase what we're already doing and help the students in the community more. And this book is kind of the start of that. So one of our instructors, Georgia, um, has created this ecology um, book that essentially monitors the movements of a bear according to the traditional seasonal rounds of the Salish calendar. Um, what we are doing is create ecology, science um, that are heavily based in TEK, the language, the culture um, of this reservation. The proceeds of these books will go back to the college to support wildlife and fisheries programs. Another thing that we're doing with Waverly funding is we are bringing in more guests and speakers and um, kind of indigenizing cr the curriculum that is currently being taught. So just what can we do to strengthen this great information that these instructors have already put together to get TEK, um, which is traditionally ecological knowledge, into the classrooms more that has that place-based um, education. And these, um, these speakers and events that are being held for these classrooms are not just specifically closed to that classroom. Uh, it's often encouraged that other people um, come and listen, partake, sit in when we have these speakers come in. Another thing that we are working on is student research. So a little bit of background. So the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes gained ownership of the once called National Bison Range in 2022. Uh, the Bison Range was taken from the Confederated Salish and Kootenai tribes without the consent in 1908. Before the tribes regained that management, there was little to no um, interaction or research done or a collaboration with Salish Kootenai College or even um, the tribe and the bison range resides kind of in the middle almost of the reservation boundaries. Um, so the research that the students are doing are to um, kind of identify what is happening. So what's happening there is there's a little bit of a phenomenon. Elk are um, grazing aquatic in aquatic plants out of Mission Creek that flows directly through the bison range. And this has been observed with other species um, such as moose, but never with elk. And it's kind of something that the students were really interested in. So they're looking at it from all aspects, um, water quality, diet, um, analyzing plants that are on land and in the water, just to kind of get a baseline and an idea of what they're eating and what is in the aquatic plants that they're, you know, searching out. Um, so community engagement. We have been working on a few different projects, but one of those happened this summer and it was a climate summer camp that was two weeks long where students K through seven were able to come in and attend um, this classroom type setting of the climate and how it affects fire and the forestry and hydrology and get some you know hands-on experience doing things building things modeling um, that was also available for 8th through 12th grade students. We are now working um, on delivering those lesson plans to the local schools in the area on the reservation um, just to kind of help the teachers um, and promote more education in climate. Um, an upcoming event that we will be hosting is a regional climate symposium. So we're partnering with the Confederated Salish and Kootenai Tribes 
to highlight um, other regional partners or organizations, nonprofits, um, federal, state, um, other tribal um, organizations, on bring them together to share their climate related work that they're doing within the region. So oftentimes what we're seeing is um, somebody will do, be doing research here and somebody will be doing research here and they might overlap or have similar um, outcomes or identified goals, um, but they're not really communicating. And so the whole point of this is just to get everybody that's doing this type of work at the table to maximize efforts rather than duplicate the efforts. And below are some topics that we will be covering at the Regional Climate Symposium um, that'll be taking place here in a few months. But that is it. Great, thank you, thank you. And our last speaker is, is Aradna, did I pronounce it right? Uh, you have the mic. Here we go, can you hear me now? Yes. All right, thanks so much. It's been really inspiring, it's so inspiring to hear um, from folks. Let's see, how do we, how do we get this to, this might work. Ooh, uh, let's see if that works. Can you see the screen? Does that work? It is, it is processing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Let's see. How's that? Yeah, not yet. Hmm. Okay. Do you want to, yeah, it's not, it's not showing up. So can you try yeah. to do a share screen when you hit present? Let's try this again. Let's just share the entire screen. How's that working? No? Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I don't see anything. All right, let's see. Um, all right, we can try this one more time. Now it says Chrome has lost permission to capture your, your screen. I might have to log out and try again. Oh, all that's right. not good. Technology. <laughs> All right, let's try that. Yeah, so we have a little bit of a tech issue, everyone, but we have time. Are there any questions we can answer while we're waiting for her to come back? Uh, any chat? questions from the audience? You can put your questions in the chat. I don't see any questions right now. But I think, you know, you know, I think while Aradna comes back on, you know, oh, she's back. Yeah, let's see. Let's try that. again. How's that? Uh, yeah, uh, that's it. We got it. Go ahead. All right, great. Uh, well, uh, yeah, thanks for the invite and sorry for those issues. My name is Aradna Tripathi and my pronouns are she, they. I'm a professor at UCLA where uh, with others we've worked to uh, found the Center for Diverse Leadership in Science, which focuses on reparative climate action and environmental imagination. Our pilot started in 2013 and the center started about five years ago in 2018. Um, I list um, many of our partners here. We have about 40 partners. 20 of them are community-based organizations and tribal authorities. And then about 20 of them are higher ed uh, institutions, MSIs. Uh, we also have um, some K through 12 schools that are also part of this um, broader coalition. Um, I'll just as a, a really quick intro, give you a summary of, of, you know, some of the impacts we've had. So LA is the second largest urban oil field in the country. 
And the, the leadership of our partners at Esperanza Community Housing and People Not Bozos in their campaign for an oil drilling buffer zone around residences, um, you know, that, that led to a ban in the city and the county being unanimously passed recently. Um, our partners at the Northern Chumash Tribal Council are campaigning for a Chumash Heritage National Marine Sanctuary, which would be the first um, example of, of tribal co-management um, in what is now the U.S. Um, and would pave the way for future models. Um, the Anawatsan Land Trust, their work for stewardship of coastal environments, for food sovereignty, fire safety, ecological health, uh, cultural wellness. Uh, they're, we're working with them, supporting their work and building relationships and power within their Native Nation and across Native Nations. Um, the Kurvunga Springs Foundation, Big Pine Paiute Tribe are doing work separately to support water stewardship and groundwater sustainability, LA and the Owens Valley respectively. Um, and Heal the Bay is working to advance community scientists in ecological restoration and environmental monitoring along our coasts. And so really following their leadership in support of their leadership, we're, we're working together. And we're doing this through an ecosystem of fellowship programs. We've supported more than 200 fellows from community fellows, early career fellows, faculty fellows. We have a veterans in green STEM program working with East LA Community College um, on a, a, a service learning program. And that's, you know, just really the tip of the spear of um, what this coalition uh, is doing. I also want to introduce myself. Uh, uh, Radha mentions my name, family is from the Fiji Islands with ancestry from India, do the colonial history of both places. Um, my family is had to be resilient uh, because of a, a number of challenges and often their hope for the next generation has been what's carried them. Uh, and so with that, with many of our partners, what we hear about is that a primary area for focusing on is really in the stewardship of the next generation from their communities, um, really so that they can reimagine what our environmental organizations and institutions can look like in support of stewardship. Now, my own journey has been one where I went to a minority serving institution and then was in predominantly white institutions and has been working in a field where we see deeply skewed vulnerabilities and impacts when it comes to climate change, but also deep exclusion. And with that, I am inspired by when I see examples of uh, radical environmental imagination and resilience, the work that our partners are doing. And so um, as a settler in California and a professor at a land grant institution, I wanna um, acknowledge that we're on the lands of the Gabrielino Tongva people, and I want to acknowledge the, this nation's stewardship of the lands and waters of Los Angeles. And I show here a photo of Curvunga Springs, a sacred spring site. And to me, the resilience that's represented here and the radical imagination that's represented here is truly remarkable. This location is unusual for Los Angeles. We think of a, where we live as an arid dryland but it really does stimulate those who visit to think about what stewardship can mean. And then I show here on the left um, a, a map of Tavanga and um, many of the Tongva place names. I wanna highlight that there were literally hundreds of springs like this, many of which are now concreted over. But um, in support of the Gabrielino Tongva's goals for healthy environments, we are in, in the midst of a project um, where indigenous students are mapping out these springs um, and also looking at some of the laws and policies governing water, water access. Now our work emphasizes the social context of what we do because of the interconnected nature of different systems and the way that they intersect when it comes to um, you know, our environments and us. Um, and Often we see that in addition to the injustice in responses that occurs, same time community expertise that often holds vital information for environmental resilience and health is overlooked. 
And so the work of the center involves imagining different relationships than the norm. Our goal is to be reparative and to be respectful of different knowledge systems and knowledge holders, irrespective of their credentials. And so this work is being done, their climate community hub having a number of different nodes and the university functioning as one of them, where the university where I work, because of this goal for many of our partners of seeing talented people from their communities come with their dreams and aspirations, be able to address the issues that they're passionate about. So we want to see opportunities for people. There's also a chance for us to leverage uh, university resources that exist from the infrastructure of the university, human resources and finance. Yet at the same time, we are working in a space that is hierarchical, exclusionary, has deep issues with justice, particularly racial justice. And we can see an, of an outcome of this when we look at these um, statistics on just the diversity of the uh, US population from the Census Bureau, and then people working in the geosciences, you know, hydrology, um, weather, uh, civil engineering, other areas. And what we see is that actually there's been a growing diversity gap despite uh, between the workforce and um, the broader population with levels that we see today, see today similar to what we had um, in the Jim Crow era. And most of the folks who are graduating with degrees going into the workforce are being trained at minority serving institutions. Non-minority serving institutions have very low rates of retention. And so that is a, is a real issue. Also for those who persist, isolation is common. You know, this uh, film, Hidden figure, Figures, describing Mary Jackson's experiences of being the first. Well, more than 50 years later, we still have that when it comes to um, the environment. People experience that in classes, in the workforce. And in fact, and you, even if you look at that, you see this at the undergraduate level and even at the graduate level, sometimes in the whole country, you might have a single black woman, no indigenous women, three Asian Pacific Islander women who might get a PhD out of several hundred women in a field in a given year. And so that's really an issue given um, the goals that, that uh, communities have identified around having a seat at the table, advancing climate action and so forth. And so firstly, what we're doing around this, um, I wanna highlight is inspired by the next generation. And this is a long struggle. It has been going on for a long time. And with that being said, every generation, including ours, our ceiling is the floor for the next generation. Um, I also wanna highlight that um, the environment that we're working with, with is a harsh one. And we intentionally work to build out connective tissue, supporting mentorship and leadership from activists and community leaders of all generations and the wisdom that they bring, the resilience and the stories that they hold. And we create our own ecosystem. So this involves you know, the sharing of knowledge and relationship across organizations through our coalition. Um, and I show several of these, of these leaders here from Chairman Lopez at the Amamutsen Tribal Band to uh, Alexi Sagona and Carolyn Rodriguez, some of the Amamutsen scholars, uh, to Nayeli Kobo and Monique Iriarte of Esperanza Community Housing. Now, I also want to highlight that there are a number of social science and education researchers and program officers that have been key for um, also supporting the work that we do, as well as uh, students and postdocs, staff and faculty. And so they bring knowledge and evidence-based strategies for retention. And collectively, they both have really worked to um, develop the model for the center which has at its heart the system of fellowship programs. Now, relationships with partners um, of many sorts have been built over years. It's really deeply founded in trust between people um, that the organizations then benefit from. And some of these have been supported by funding, like the ones that are underlined already. Others are ones where, where um, we have very established relationships and others, new relationships that are being being developed, which the different colors are symbolizing. And so really the goal is to 
work to reshape culture for climate justice. And this is done through linking people for together, organizations together in uh, team-based initiatives that lead to actionable science land back type climate action strategies that are identified by community-based organizations, tribal authorities, and young people, the next generation. Um, these are place-based uh, and range from research and educational projects, cross-generational learning and exchange, um, cross-organizational partnerships, higher education courses, K through 12 courses with service learning, curriculum <clears throat> workshops, um, from GIS to community health. Um, otherwise, um, mobile field labs, um, the opening up of university labs so that they're co-managed by community-based organizations, um, increasing community capacity to advance their own strategies and policies, increasing our higher ed capacity and more. We have a logic model um, that we utilize where we are, you know, identified a number of different issues um, and really are thinking about issues around culture um, as being kind of key for, for having kind of transferable structures and direct impact. We focus deeply on the re relational um, and really recognizing the need for um, support of our, of our partners in the work they want to do around climate action and building kind of capacity and capacity expanding work on, on all of our parts. Now, um, the structure we take is with this fellowship type program, as I've mentioned, and uh, within the parts that sit within the university that I'm based, we uh, have our external partners on our advisory board. Um, we directly meet with our partners. We have different advisory councils and leadership teams that all have autonomy and are resourced, um, and then also have uh, staff, usually with bi-organizational um, affiliations, um, so that there's kind of some deep uh, connection with with the work and trust that gets built out through the the work that we're doing, and then the director as a steward um, of this. So, because we kind of serve as we have, you know, and with this decentralized approach and as sort of a bit of an octopus, that also means that we touch on many different things, and this. And it just gives you a sense of, you know, we have an environmental justice working group, uh, a stewards network, um, a storytelling as medicine series. We do anti-racism workshops for faculty, administrators, and future faculty. We have many kind of different um, parts to what we what we do. And so we've awarded um, over 200 early career fellowships. Our outreach engages a number of people and our fellows identify um, the engagement they want to participate in that's usually meaningful to them because of their identities. Um, we have honorary fellows and community fellows um, so far from 10 organizations um, that we have fellows from or other organizations we work with more loosely as partners. Um, but the ones from these organizations are actually developing uh, projects or co-PIs or PIs on grants. Um, and then we have a number of faculty fellows that um, are our partners as well, show some of our, of our demographics for our early career fellows program. So the partnerships we have are largely in California, but there are partners across the country. Um, and with some of our partners, for example, we've worked on a, creating a Navajo Scholars Network with other partners, a Women of Color Faculty Network in Green STEM. Um, so really with this, we're working to put social theory and knowledge into practice to support the health of people, to support the health of communities, um, and also healthy relationships. So this kind of these principles of rep reparative work are, are really key. Um, and with that, we are really working to try to break down silos and dismantle hierarchies to bend towards justice, knowing that this will be a long haul that we're, we're in and has been a long haul. The um, impacts of doing and of truly deeply inclusive, equitable and just work um, means that we're building power in places where there has been power and we're recognizing power and supporting um, community led 
blood work. I'm just one kind of example of partnership is around bringing together diverse perspectives on water. Um, and I've highlighted at the beginning, you know, some of the work with Ankurvunga Springs, but this really involves multiple Tongva bands, a Tatavium and um, multiple Owens Valley Paiute tribes, including the Bishop Paiute and the Big Pine Paiute, and is focusing on multiple areas as shown on the on the right. Um, so with that, I want to thank you and turn it over to the next person. No, thanks. These have been excellent presentations. Uh, so happy to see you know, the funding from the Early History Foundation and, you know, you know, want to give them so many flowers, but it's been great having a foundation that's really investing in these in these hubs. And as you heard, I believe in the discussion, maybe it was to, oh, today, uh, the keynote speaker, you know, Robin uh, Morris Collin, she was talking specifically about hubs and she was talking about the TikToks as hubs. But I think, as Dr. Densu stated, you know, having these uh, community driven hubs, right? And, and y'all, just to kind of, just for me, what I've heard from you, you have hubs that are co-creating, co-defining between communities and universities, hubs that are, that are, that are uh, uh, focused on and, and using the anchor institutions uh, from historic black colleges uh, to indigenous uh, servant institutions as well. So just really exciting uh, to hear that. So we're going to move now into the Q&A portion of our, our of our um, session and I think you know to Aradna as you mentioned like this this sharing right I think we want to make sure this in this session we're sharing with each other and I think that's that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have this session I think it's what Wayland Street Foundation if they have anybody on board listening I know y'all wanted this as, as well as you know make sure the hubs are talking to each other too and we're having some uh best practices lessons learned shared as I said to you to everyone before I'm also a a, a, a grant Between some of the the issues that that you're addressing compared to your fellow panelists that are on this uh, in this session, and also some of your approaches, I I saw I heard a lot of overlap in the approaches and some of the best practices. But can who wants to chime in about issues that are uh, you know similar and some of the best practices or approaches that y'all are using that that I think uh, what, what should be best practices that we prioritize um, you know as as we implement these hubs. Who wants to chime in first? I know that's two questions. So you want to talk about issues I first? Think, you can pick it up. Go ahead, Cicely. No, I, I do think one of the failures of mainstream um, sustainability in the past, um, quote unquote, or before they moved into environmental justice, I, I feel like sometimes they would miss the people for the trees. And so I do think a common practice among all of our hubs um, is centering um, the people and like um, making sure the culture uh, is at the heart of this and then building out from there. And so instead of us from the outside looking in, like studying people and like what they're like. Instead, we are using um, non-traditional methods of learning from people that we aren't there to pour into people, but we are there to um, preserve and uplift and amplify uh, many of the richness that already exists in our community. So we don't assume that there isn't nothing there and we are coming and bringing it to them. We assist that there, we all have that the people are there and they have the knowledge base and things that they need to heal their community. And so how can we help them with some of the resources and things that we have uh, better amplify and place that and uplift these practices um, to a larger audience um, and community than it previously was. So just to, the, just to highlight one of the things you said, culture, how can we focus more on cultural uh, and even bring a cultural, how culture is part of a cultural wellness model. Right. And when it comes to how we do education, um, any other panelists wants to chime in on this question? Uh, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I think that, you know, I was I was really moved when I uh, heard Sierra's talk um, in learning about how um, community college students um, who are tribal members are they they made these observations about the elk and were posing their own questions and then doing the work to address those questions. So this kind of aspect of um, engagement, um, identity development, 
empowerment, um, and you know, and and leadership is so powerful to kind of see that. And I think that's something that actually stands out for all of what I've seen. But I thought that particular example really encapsulates it when community members, you know, again, they're leading, they're posing the questions, they're doing, they're resourced to do the work in ways that are healthy. And that's what makes it reparative. That's what makes, you know, the program itself a, a one that's a, a healing one. Um, and that, yeah, so I just really wanted to give that a shout out. Thank you. No, thank you for that. So healing. So I like this. So we got culture, we got healing. Um, yeah, go ahead, Sierra. You want to chime in? Yeah, I was just going to say thank you so much for that. The, uh, you know, the whole process of the bison range is, is pretty emotional for a lot of tribal members. You know, our family has been here for generations. Um, and, you know, for my great great grandma to see that land you know taken away from the people and then having the opportunity to be a part and see you know it being handed back over to you know the, the hands that it should have been in for the entire time um and be a part of that research that's happening is just it's healing you know not just for me but for my family and i'm sure for you know the, my ancestors like it's just it is an emotional thing that um, is also now a happy thing. Uh, before it was, you know, sad and we didn't go there to the place with the fences. <laughs> we, we just didn't. Um, so this project and being able to get other students up there is, is really healing. And I just want to thank you for acknowledging that. Yeah, I want to, um, it's okay. I also want to say that when you talked about healing in the fences, it, um, and the experiences of, of grandparents, it made me think about um, the stories that, you know, we hear from Monique, um, you know, and her daughter, Nayeli, who lived across, who lived across from this urban oil field. And Nayeli, you know, has shared publicly about the, asthma that she developed, then the cancer that she developed at the age of 17, right when she was gonna start college, about other youth from the community who are developing leukemia. Um, you know, the chemotherapy, the pain, even though now it's in remission. Um, and when I hear from, you know, uh, Timothy Watkins Jr. about in Jordan Downs, the high levels of lead in the soils there, like this, this is about, you know, um, this, this is about people's lives. This is about healing, right? And this is about the pain that parents and their kids and grandkids and their, yeah, their families and their neighbors are experiencing. So this is about wellness. This is about healing. And so thank you for that. Nope. Thank you both. Powerful, powerful statements about wellness, healing, and I mean this issue of and don't want to and I and I wanna, you know, chime in too much, but the framing that I sometimes use just to try to be more uh bring in more of the the spiritual and the psychological is the trauma, right? The the trauma that is the intergenerational trauma and this in the land back movement. You know, we talk about restorative justice. You're talking about land back bringing education, empowerment, right? So it's just appreciating how do we use, you know, these hubs, this engagement, even using science, you know, because I, I try to be careful about the science part. And in my session, my next session, which is really this session is really a, a continuation of what I'm, I'm going to talk about in my next session. I'm talking about uh, empowerment, liberation science. We're talking right now empowerment in liberation science. So I'm really excited. I'm talking too much. I know Dr. Denson, you wanted to chime in a few minutes ago. And uh, and just again that that connection, Dr. Densu, uh, when you think of the work you're doing around agroecology in land, culture, health, wellness. Go ahead, Dr. Densu, if you want to chime on that or what you were gonna say before. You're on mute, yes, sir. There you go. I'll I'll just add to the discussion instead of going back. Like one project we're engaged in, uh, there's a community site program at FAMU. Uh, started uh, 
by Kobe Cambone, and it was the emphasis on culturally relevant psychology rooted in dealing with trauma in the Black community from a community psych perspective. People would also use the term African centered. So the centered, for instance, around these deeper cultural issues has partnered with the psych department to develop methods to look at the way Black folk look at land and considering trauma as a particular challenge through oral interviews, uh, through conversations, and through literally physically land-based discussions where uh, folks tell stories about their experiences with land. And then that information is often going to be used to deal with questions around food and material security, but also air property. So you know, within our communities, there's land loss uh, through external forces, but particularly how those, you know, like Emil Carr Cabral said, regardless of the external issues, the internal contradictions are more fundamental. So how can that knowledge be used to resolve internal family uh, conflict and craft uh, identity, purpose, and direction for that family to emerge out of their spaces to deal with how to hold on to land. So there's a lot of conflict in families that kind of, what's the word I want to use, will prevents our ability to deal with the external issues in simple terms. So we're working on that, uh, and that's, a, that's an ongoing project. Uh, this, this divide just around, I like to call it the urban, um, damn, I forget the term I use, privileging urban spaces, you know, the urban bias, you know, so our whole cultural vision of what life and development looks like is rooted in this urban bias. And, and for me, that's a cultural issue and very much a trauma issue because once you, you, kind of reassociate people. I when I heard Sierra talk about the whole idea of the bison and how people are framing and experiencing it and feeling that uh, her ancestors in the intergenerational context, the families in that space, that's profound uh, on multiple levels. Um, so that's just to share about something concrete we're building in the center. Oh, thank you for that. And I may be confused in the sessions, but this session is awesome. But there's a there's a session that's happening uh, with um, when it's when it's wet red elk on first foods. Uh, the, and I'm not sure if it's the, in this time slot or in the next time slot. But that's another part of the discussion building off of Sarah's work. Uh, and I just wanted about the bison. Just wanted to connect the dots. Right again, the power of culture, the power of history, the power of ecological knowledge, the power of com uh, cultural knowledge, community knowledge. Right. That's what we. We're hearing and how we do this work together and, and, and impact change. So again, I really appreciate uh, you know what the, the stories and narratives been uh, woven uh, through the conversation today. I'm, I'm gonna go to the um, the the attendees, the audience, and and, and take a question, y'all. So question is, how are, how are you all intent intentionally making yourself known within communities? I think you covered some of that, but maybe. Uh, maybe it wasn't clear for 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 just in general be a good question how you really been intentional with with getting to doing community engagement outreach and are people coming to your spaces or are you deployed among the people example using public spaces for training so it's a multi-part question who wants to go first oh um, take that oh, go ahead go, go ahead Sierra. okay um so with the regional climate symposium that we have coming up, we're also going to be hosting a community dinner um, on the second day, or maybe at the end of the first day, we're still trying to figure out the logistics of that. But the purpose of this is we will create presentation based upon what our regional partners in the area are doing and then present that to the community as far as this is the work that you know is happening at a tribal level, a federal level, a state employee or NGO level um, and then kind of leave it open to them to see what they would like to see if they have any comments on anything. Um, so that's just one aspect of it. But also the 
uh, climate camps, I feel is very community engaging because we're going to be going into the classrooms and teaching this curriculum that was developed this past summer to the youth on the Flathead Reservation. Um, and a lot of the times what we see is kids that learn in the classrooms get engaged and then they bring it home with them and they teach their parents. Um, and I know that from firsthand experiences, but uh, that's just some of the things that we're doing to engage the community and there'll be more on the horizon. Cool, thank you. Anyone else wants to chime in on that? Yeah, I can. I think I can. Be, oh, go ahead. No, it's just leave. Go ahead. Okay, I was going to say, I think for it to be most effective, you have to have some of both. Um, it can't be something that just lives on your campus because depending on how it is in campus, it may be unapproachable for some. But I think that there is a rich um, beauty that comes from not thinking of this as just an opportunity for the students to learn. Um, and thinking about it from that perspective, but how is everyone um, involved in this in this learning journey and what does that look like? Um, and there's a really richness that comes from like real practical knowledge that can't be learned inside the campus gates. And so I think you have to go off campus and in order for people to really see what this resilience could look like in their neighborhoods, then they need to see it, hear it, breathe it, experience it in the, their own, literally in their own front or backyards. Um, and so I, I think you have to utilize those spaces so that people start to see um, learning and environments um, all around them and how what this looks like and how science can be accessible to them and something that is totally applicable to their communities where they live. Aradna, you want to jump in? Sure. Um, I think that I guess things, things to add. So yeah, when we have convenings trying to ensure that we're we're talking with our partners about where they want to see that at and often that is within the communities if we do things like town halls that those are within communities but also with organizing um organizing kind of visits to really think about uh, opportunities for um broader exchange bi-directional exchange um, and then thinking about the kind of arc of that where that's, I think, Im important. We have also been supporting um, uh, when, you know, when our partners comes to visit us to support first developing healthy relationships with the land and the indigenous um, peoples and nations of the area. So we will usually um, connect with one of our local tribal partners to see if there's there's an opportunity to engage in a, a in a visit for if there's interest in visiting the sacred spring site, engaging in service, um, honoring local expertise and stewardship, um, and so then that that ends up being something that is you know building out kind of a broader set of relationships as as well, uh, yeah. I'm having problems on muting. So yeah, for, for me in, in our hub, just to chime in, um, we we have a hub that's funded by multiple sources, the Mid-Atlantic Climate Action Hub. And so we have community partners uh, in Philadelphia, uh, in the Eastern Shore of Southern Delaware, Baltimore, uh, DC, New Jersey, uh, also Virginia and Prince George's County that are, that are acting at our hub and spoke approach. So we'll be doing some, uh, in, they'll be doing a lot of engagement in that geographic area coverage, but part of it is we're trying to provide resources and tools uh, so, they can, so they can have more infrastructure, be, be able to do that engagement. And we talked about having, um, as was, as a Rod mentioned, uh, having town halls, doing um, uh, road shows, uh, doing listening sessions, uh, and, and other ways to, you know, you know, take the work to the people as much as possible. But I think one of the ways to take the work of the people which these hubs are presenting is how you have anchor community partners, anchor institutional partners who are already known entities, uh, uh, trusted entities too, I think that's important in, in, in building relationships to bring in more trusted entities to help with that local 
uh, hyper local engagement and outreach. Thank you for that, everybody. Any any other questions or thoughts? Go ahead. I thought someone was about to chime in. Other questions from the audience? Yeah, you're welcome, Stephanie. So for, for me, just another kind of thought, you know, so we talked about wellness, you know, you know, the framework around uh, co-design, uh, focusing on, you know, um, cultural uh, T, TK, uh, community knowledge. Are there any other, for, for the audience uh, panelists, are there any other, you know, things you think would be important if we're going to expand these hubs uh, beyond our set of hubs to other areas of the country, what 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 do you think should be what we should be doing trying to replicate and scaling up from uh, the lessons learned uh, in the work in progress uh, for our for our shared group? Um, I think we have to, and somewhat adopt this from indigenous um, people as well, the concept of land stewardship. Um, instead of ownership of things, but just stewardship in general of the earth and like that it is here for us to be taken care of and not something for us to own or have control over. Um, and with that, I think we have to release, you know, just sort of the control or, you know, for a lot of people need to tuck their capes of like the idea that somehow we are coming to different communities or other stuff to save them. I don't think that people need saving. I think people know very well what is most needed um, to heal and nurture their communities. They just may lack the network or resources or other things um, to get what it is they need. And so how can we be um, in true partnership, um, true comrades, allies, whatever it is with communities um, that we both live, work, um, you know, learn in to, to grow and build what it really means like um, uh, to, to do climate mitigation um, and taking um, centering it around equity and justice and health and what does that look like and so I think we have to shift that concept of, that has been fed to us for a while about us knowing best or being experts when we're surrounded by experts and people who know best and so how can we amplify and support that Good. powerful statement uh, again I could soapbox all day <laughs> about about what you just said uh, credential pe people are the experts right uh, whose knowledge counts, who whose research counts, whose solutions count. So I think very, very important statement that you got. I mean, that's also we talked about culture, change the culture, how we do this work. Um, I, I think that's really, really important. Uh, others want to chime in? Go ahead, Aradna, will you want to chime in? Yeah, I think that there's so much to be learned from the um, kind of the the leadership development programs and uh, emphasis on wellness that uh, many community-based organizations and tribal organizations have. I was struck when, for example, talking with the uh, Amamutsun Tribal Band and going to a cultural wellness meeting, um, learning about their um, their own governance structure and their whole system of organizations and programs that have been created from, you know, a, a youth summer camp, um, cultural wellness, uh, regular cultural wellness me meetings to having a stewardship core. Um, there was also a Mutsun Scholars Program you know, so there's this whole ecosystem that they had built out that um, in many ways, you know, models what I what I see in other uh, other organizations. And I thought, oh, you know, there's a real end of opportunity for learning there with this emphasis on wellness or learning about Esperanza's Promotores program and then also their youth, their vision for youth development um, and what that what that should look like. Um, there's also some kind of interesting programs that like the Ocean Discovery Institute where they've got a community center that has a kitchen at the heart of it. Um, and then, um, you know, these 
different areas to, that are focused in different aspects of climate resilience. But, you know, the family, the community, food is really at the, the heart of it. They have a scientist in residence program so that people from kind of, um, you know, external formal research environments can come in and be part of the community and learn from um, and share with the community. And so, yeah, I think these these models to me are, are are ones that we should be uplifting also as climate hubs, right? That that this kind of model for climate community hubs needs to also center center those models too. Oh, no, thank you for that. So leadership development models, uh, integrating cultural wellness. So you, you talked about promotors. I think we have ex excellent example of promotor programs uh, across the country. Uh, youth engagement programs, uh, youth leadership, youth council programs. I think in an NSSP session, you heard about that youth councils, right? Uh, yesterday in the, in the plenary session, uh, we I had a community mentor. He had a he had a program called the Dream Network with Michael Wilson in Medford, North Carolina. The Dream Network, and not a lot of those folks who started as young people, they're lawyers. They work in the EJ movement, so that's like you know investments of 20, 30, and they're in their forties, going on fifty now. So that that type of uh, pathway pipeline development is really important. Uh, uh, Sierra, uh, Dr. Densu, any thoughts? We have like three minutes left. No, I, I'm just affirming essentially what everyone says, and I appreciate it. This kind of, to some degree, decentralized approach to me is important, but really these hubs, instead of saying decentralized, the hubs rooting themselves in the local communities in which they exist, in developing models that can be shared in other spaces. I think that's most critical. So however we envision living this sustainable, resilient life, we root that in the spaces in which we live and then we exist in networks of solidarity with other folk, sharing that information and building capacity and exchanging resources, be they, be they material or human, towards our broader goals. So, I, I mean, get, I guess we could say that that adage, act locally, uh, think globally, or think regionally, or think beyond your space, but definitely root yourself, become indigenous to the spaces in which you exist. I like Out. that. Yeah. So thank you, thank you for that. Uh, and then, the, the, and I forgot to say, as, as Cicely mentioned before, this land stewardship, framework, making sure we follow more of a land stewardship, not land ownership. And uh, also that could be a, you can apply that to data stewardship and science stewardship because the whole scientific enterprise is extractive. Another soapbox of mine, I'm gonna talk about my session, my next session, <laughs> but it's, it's, it's antithetical to empowerment liberation science. Uh, so how do we push back against that as, as we act, if we're using science in these hubs, right? And making sure that community science is uplifted, right? Uh, I think both Sicily, and Rodney has said that. Sarah, you wanna you wanna close us out this last minute with any thoughts about what you see for for our hubs, as as as, as Dr. Densu said, uh, being anchored root in the community, but also in solidarity with each other, and then sharing uh, best practices and learning and allyship. Go ahead. Yeah. So my experience with Waverly has been you know pretty brief. I started this job six months ago, roughly, and some of the work that I'm doing and the projects and the collaboration with different people across the reservation and community members is, is is a dream like this isn't something that everybody can do and having this opportunity to help the tribe help the people help the college students is absolutely amazing and so i just want to express uh, gratitude for the waverly street foundation for seeing that there were things that needed to be done. And it sounds like everybody um, across the board is having some of those same issues and just trying to meet in the middle and figure out, you know, what we can do together to make it better. So, so uh, excellent words to end this session on. I want to thank all the panelists for, for a great session. It is really for me to see colleagues uh, across the uh, age spectrum who are working on these climate hubs and, and, and hearing that y'all are doing the same things that I'm doing with, 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 with the hub that I'm collaborating on with community partners in the Mid-Atlantic. So appreciate y'all. And, it, and it's really great again to see how 
your hubs are really uh, people centered and you're, and you're trying to, you know, getting back to the thing that's supposed to trying to build power, grow power and growing, getting back to this issue of land and food is really, really like that. And that wellness part, I think, how do we how do we really uh, focus on wellness? Um, I think it's important and cultural cultural wellness is really important. So I appreciate y'all. Uh, thank you for your time. And uh, hopefully as we move forward uh, as, as grantees that we can, you know, meet. Um, I know Dr. Dr. Wright is having our HBCU meeting uh, in a couple of weeks in October. I'm not sure any of y'all are going to that meeting, but I know she she's also a, a grantee. But we look forward to meeting y'all in the future and collaborating and sharing best practices and, and, and growing community and growing power. So thank you. Y'all take care. Take care. Yes, sir.